food for me. It's a real treat to come here to British Columbia. This is one of my favorite places on earth to visit. Um, I spend I spend a lot of time. One of the great benefits of my job is that I get to spend a lot of time in Canada. Um, and I come up here not only professionally. I come up for my vacations. I go do a um, canoe trip every summer in Algonquin Park in Ontario. I usually do a whitewater trip either in BC and Mid Coast or um, over in New Brunswick or, or northern Quebec every summer. I just came down from a uh, 10 day camping trip um, up in the Arctic and in uh, north, on the western part of James Bay in Moosonay with, um, with, uh, with Gord Downey, who's one of my board members of Waterkeeper. We have uh, here in, in BC a, uh, a river keeper on the Fraser River. Like I spent a lot of time, get to spend a lot of time in BC, and um, I just I love Canada. I love the the people here. I love the landscapes. I love the sense of community. I said to um, to Gary Mason a few hours ago, and we were talking about that um, that it would be great if the Canadian people did some mentoring with um, our country about how to behave. And, um, I, I, kind of, I, I kind of think, I'd say this a lot, I kind of think the United States is the 14th province of the um, um, uh, And I, I mean all that. I just, I, I think this country is so fantastic and that um, what, uh, particularly the last few years, uh, you know, some bad stuff has happened over the past few years politically in this country from my point of view, but also, there's a, when I first started coming up to Canada many years ago, there was not a, really a sense of nationhood, um, and I was, I was up and did a lot of, I spent a lot of time in Quebec, no, I think Quebec, fighting uh, with the Cree people against the James Bay Project, and that time Quebec was really kind of serious on withdrawing you know, from Canada and you, um, and there wasn't really a great sense of national pride. And I think a lot of the choices that have been made by this country, particularly not getting into the Iraq War, and a lot of other stuff has, um, have, you know, made Canadians really feel proud of their country for, for really good reasons. There are a lot of battles that you have to fight up here and some bad stuff that's happened recently as well, but um, it's, you have an amazing country and I love it. And I. One of the great um, privileges I've had has been able to work with First Nation people across Canada. My first battle was back in the 80s on James Bay, where I saw this extraordinary land ethic that we saw here tonight, where you had um, the biggest uh, construction project in the history of mankind was being proposed, 614 dams and dikes. They were going to build a hydro Quebec, was going to build a, um, it was going to dam 11 major rivers, inundate an area larger than Lake Erie, destroy the ecology of an area the size of France, all of it, which was owned by the Korean Indians, never been conquered in a war, never been signed a treaty, and they were never informed of the project until they heard about it on the radio. And they, um, they asked me to come up, and I spent a lot of time up in northern Quebec for the next couple of years. And it was, you know, Hydro Quebec finally, they were going to use the money of the province of Quebec to finance the secession of Quebec from the rest of Canada. And the um, and the, and they you know they finally ultimately alter, uh, um, offered the Cree a billion dollars to ten thousand poverty stricken Cree, and to their credit, they turned down the money and said no, we want the rivers, and that was something we just don't see elsewhere. And then, as a result of our success in that area, I was asked several years later to come out to um, Clackett Sound and kind of act as a liaison between the New Child North and five. Indian nations and the environmental community, and there was some sort of rough relations out there. I ended up being able to participate in some of the treaty negotiations, and really, um, that was a you know really a historic success. Where again, the First Nations people said, "This land is um, has to be you know we want to get an economic development here. We want to do it in a way that preserves our values and, and is sustainable and preserves the aspirations of future generations." I was able to work with the Git Gap on the Mid Coast. I just, um, I've been able to work with the Pequot up in northern Manitoba on many similar issues. And I'm working with the Green now on stopping 
in Western Ontario, uh, stopping some dams up on Lucent and in Israel. They've been terrific partners with me, and I want to commend the, um, the First Nations in the Mid Coast, which is one of my favorite places in the world. And I've done a bunch of first ascents, kayaking up on Filer Creek, and um, and just I love that area. It's under threat right now. And one of the big threats to the Great Bear Rainforest is, is you know is the uh, is the pipe that's kind of they're trying to put through the oil pipeline coming from down from um, the tar sands in Alberta. They're going to put it on through the top of the rainforest, and then they're going to um, uh, create a port on the coast of BC, and they have to end the moratorium on tanker traffic off the coast, which is not a good place for tank traffic. It's a very uh, stormy, rocky coast. Um, and it's the biggest boondoggle probably in the history of mankind. It just is a, it's an insanely wasteful, stupid, uneconomic, and irrational. <laughs> But you know, one thing that I found working with the with the First Nations was that on um, you know I had so much about just the sense of community that you find, and I see this. And that's one of the reasons I really admire Canadian people. Really, there is a sense of of community and and, um, and that the recognition that we're not protecting the environment for so much for the sake of the fishes and the birds, but we're protecting it for our own sake because we recognize that nature is the infrastructure of our communities. And that if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, we've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, that the shared resource of our society, what, we, what historically has been known as the public trust resources, the commons, or the commonwealth, those assets that cannot be reduced to private property ownership, but by their nature are, are the property of the entire community, the shared resource of the community. They have public landscapes, the, the rivers and, and waterways that connect us to our past, to our history, that provide context to our communities, and that are the source ultimately of our values and virtues and our, our character as a people. One of the big things that you hear you know, in Washington, D.C., and increasingly um, in, uh, in Ottawa, and, and from the provincial capitals as well, and from you know, the, big, the, the, the big polluters in Canada and the United States, and their indentured servants in our political process, and their sock puppets and you know, <laughs> toadies, is that you know, I, you know, we have to choose between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. And that's a false choice. In 100% of the situations, good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the long term, over the generation, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what they've been urging us to do with the big polluters and their their cronies urge us to do, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity. We can generate a, you know, an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy. We can make a whole, you know, a small group of people rich by making everybody else poor. Um, but our children are gonna pay for our children and they're gonna pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that are going to amplify over time, and then they'll never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spend. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. One of the things that I've done over the past quarter century as an environmental advocate is to constantly go around and confront this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure. The same as investing in telecommunications and road construction. 